want to speak on God's warrant for divine health and healing. God's warrant for divine health and healing. When I say that, I'm not saying no one ever gets sick. That's why we need it. I'm not saying we never need to look at a doctor. We have doctors in our assembly. We have nurses in our assembly, midwives in our assembly. We have GPs, general practitioners in our assembly. So we're not saying we don't need the health service or we don't respect them, we do. Please let that be known, we do. Tonight, maybe you've come and your illness is only known to you. You can't put a plaster on it. You can't put a plaster cast on it. You can't touch it and rub it. Maybe you can't do anything with it. Maybe it's unseen. Maybe it's something that you've felt in your heart and you've been hurt. You need healing from the Lord for that. Maybe it's spiritual. Maybe it's an an addiction that needs broken. It's all healing from the Word of God. Not only an addiction that needs broken, maybe you've come with a depression that needs lifted. It's all healing from the Word of God. Not every illness can be seen. You know that. There's many people suffer every day because of an illness, and people can't see it. You can't stitch it up with needle and thread, and you can't help it in any other way. But God can. His Word is living. Great illnesses are also no obstacle to God. No matter what the illness says, it's no obstacle to the Lord. This is of the utmost importance. The most important part of this evening is the Word of God. It's the authority of God's Word. It's the Word of God entering your heart. I remember when my own wife had ME. And at times she even needed to be fed. She couldn't lift a fork or a spoon to her mouth. Remember the times she had to be carried out of meetings and it was like she just went limp as though there was no life in her like she was dead myself and another pastor at times carried her out she had to sleep in bed for days on end and couldn't get up and there was no prayer meeting there was no healing service listen and we went to prayer meetings and we went to healing services and we we anointed with oil we done it all and it seemed like healing wasn't coming so we never give up if you've been to others don't give up Because one Sunday morning, the Word of God came to her heart and she stood up in a meeting and worshipped. And the Lord healed her on the spot. It was about 1999. And she has went on since with never another bout of ME ever since that. So this is the healing power of God. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. I'm not asking you to do anything tonight that will embarrass you. But there are many of you in here over the last few years. Would you encourage others who are maybe looking for healing, or maybe you're coming back for more. If we have prayed before for you, and the Lord has moved in you, or your family, your little one, or whatever, and the Lord has touched you and done some miracle for you, would you just raise up your hand and let me see? Look at this. Look all over this house. Look. All over the house. Look. Healing all over the house. Now, it's not nothing to do with me. So if your eyes are on me, you've come for the wrong reason. It's nothing to do in anyone in here. It's to do in the Word of God and His authority through the merits of the cross of Calvary where Christ shed His blood and died. There's healing all over the house here. And I believe God's going to move again tonight. Please, if you've got an illness, unless you can show us it on the spot, which before and after, please don't come and say, okay, I know I'm well, I'm healed again. Go and get checked out by your doctor. If you've been to your doctor, please go do that. We're not looking for anything to be false. We're not looking for pretense because it's just lying. We're looking for reality of God because the Holy Ghost doesn't need anything else because he's real. Let's turn to the scriptures, please, tonight. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8. God's warrant for, for, for divine health and healing. This could be such a big topic. It's from our lifestyles even, we could talk about keeping us in health. Our lifestyles, the the, the way we live our lives, the the lack of exercise. I'm not talking about having to do 10 mile runs every night now. Lack of exercise in in men and women today. I'm talking about what we eat, what we put into ourselves, what we drink, the stuff that's in our food, that all could be done, that the government could change. There's any amount of stuff that we could think of 
for keeping us in health. But what we want to do is look at the miraculous power of God tonight and what God says in his word. So God's warrant for divine health and healing. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thy clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way. Show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. We're going to look at others in this uh, chapter uh, for the next few moments. So please keep that chapter open. The Lord Jesus heals this leper, then tells him to go to the priest. Why? Because the priests were the doctors then. They went to examine, according to the law, what the leprosy spot looked like and if it was truly healed. In other words, they went to get it verified. In other words, the work of God can stand scrutiny. The true work of God will stand scrutiny. No matter what it is, God's work can stand scrutiny under every circumstance and in every situation. So he says, go do that. And don't be running about saying, I get healed, I get healed, I get healed. He says, go and do what God has commanded by going to the priest and looking to see how it was. Was it white or was it red? Was it encircled and so on? You can read it in the book of Leviticus. Notice that's why Christ tells him to go to the priest, to have the, the God's work and his miracles verified as reality. But notice this, we want to look first of all, and these are quick, at his will, searching for his will, his word, his warmth, his warning, his warrant, his ways. First of all, the leper comes, we're told, and he worshipped him, worshipped the Lord Jesus. Now you need to understand this. Because maybe you're coming, I'm trying to reach a, a plethora of different people with different ideas, with different theologies, with different thoughts and different philosophies and different things that they've been taught and told and different ways to look at this. But here it says they wor- he worshipped him. And the word for worship here is the word proscuneo. It comes from two words, pros, which means to come towards, and cuneo, which means to kiss. Now, this man was a leper. He didn't actually kiss the Lord Jesus. He didn't get right to the Lord Jesus because he had to stay at least 12 feet away from anyone or he was breaking the law and he didn't want to break the law. He was unclean. He was a leper. So it means coming towards Jesus, he started to worship. As he approached Jesus, he started to worship him. The idea here to worship means to worship at his word. That's why I'm saying the word is so important. It's, this is the most important part. You could take the word and the word will speak to you and change you in your seat. You not even need to do anything else tonight. That's the authority of God's word, not the authority of a man from a pulpit. Notice what he says here. It says, that he worshipped him. In other words, he worshipped at the word that Christ had spoken. If you go into chapter 7, just for time's sake, the Lord Jesus, he says this in verse 7, Ask, it shall be given you. Seek, ye shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, or carnal that is, in other words, a human being, and you know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? The Lord Jesus is speaking this. This man is hearing these words. He's standing aloof. People are talking about it. Talking about what's happened around the mountainside. Talking about what he said up the mountainside. And this man takes the word by faith. Well, he said it, and I believe it. So if he says it and it settles it, then I'll believe it and then we'll receive it. Notice what he says here again. The Lord Jesus in his teaching goes on down and he talks about a wise man building his house on a rock and a foolish man on the sand. And he says, when the storms come and the flood and the rains come, he says, a man whose house is built on the rock, it shall not be washed away. In other words, he will stand in the faith that he has been given. He will stand firm on the only foundation that is Christ. He says, and if you're standing in me, he says, and your foundation will never be moved. 
Maybe you're in your mind and, you're, uh, uh, and you, you get down, or maybe you're depressed, or maybe you're in your mind you're worried, you're afraid or something like that. And maybe all these things are happening and you're saying, all oh, the, the sand is washed underneath you. You'll fall if you're not grounded in Christ and his word. Here, this man hears it. Look what it says in chapter 7, verse 28. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. They were astonished at his teaching. Why? For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. In other words, he wasn't a convert belt preacher. He, wasn't, he didn't download it as many preachers do now off the internet, other men's sermons and preach them to their, their congregation. He wasn't a parrot who just mimicked things that he heard. He was a prophet, and he was a prophet from Almighty God. He was the Son of God but he was a prophet sent from God. And the word which he carried was the word that was spoken to these people. You see what they did? They took the writings off the, of the rabbis and they transferred them into their own writings, rabbi to rabbi. They became different and changed and watered down. And they lived according to the rabbi's teachings as though the rabbi's words were equal to the word of God. Here Christ comes and speaks the direct word of God from God through Christ to the people. The people hear it and now they're astonished. That's what happens when men and women grasp hold that this word is not just a book of fairy tales and fables and little old stories. This is the living word from the living God. So he taught them as one having authority. And as the scribes, he comes down the mountain and this leper comes worshipping. It means he comes toward him worshipping at the word. My brothers and sisters, you've heard me a few times and our assembly say, you know, you just don't need to sing or music and thank the Lord he's given us all these talented people and we love you, you know that. And we appreciate that. But also, we don't need to worship in anything but the Word of God. I worship when I read the Word of God. I worship Him and I draw close to Him in the Word. And you should do the same tonight. So if the Word of God is reaching you already, God's calling you with His Spirit. Now I come closer. The Word's calling you, come closer. He's now going to ground faith in you. He's building you up. He's saying, now listen, take hold. Take it home. Build your foundation from here. Let it be grounded on this Word. Let your healing be grounded on the Word. And let's see what God is going to say to us. So he comes, gives the idea of a dog licking his master's hand. My big dog, whenever I come in, he runs around and around in circles around me, and he near knocks me over a few times. He's happy to see me, I think. And he comes around, he lies eventually against me, sits down, and he puts his head up, and he leans it on me like this. And my hands are, he nudges it with his nose, and he licks me, and it means, scratch me. The idea here is that this man came, this man was a leper, he had no contact, but as he came towards him, he said, you're the one who says ask, you're the one who says to seek, you're the one who says to knock, you're the one whose word is living, you're the one who has authority, you're the one who teaches and not as the scribes teach. There's something in you and about you, and I know if I can just come, oh, please, will you do something? Is there someone tonight who is desperate enough to do that for what they need from God? So, he cries, Lord, if I wilt, thou canst make me clean. The word Lord here is kurios, and it means master, sir, one who is in supreme authority and control. In other words, it is the name of God. So he's coming to Christ, he's saying, I know you're more than a man, you're God. You are the living God, the Son of God. And he comes toward him, and he's crying, master, sir, or the supreme God. Notice this, the word Lord also means he to whom a person or a thing belongs, about which he has the power of deciding over. So he's saying, I'm proclaiming you as Lord as he's approaching him, and I'm worshiping you because you are the word, not just speaking the word. You are Almighty God, and you have the power to decide over me. I'm claiming you as Lord, I belong to you. If someone yet not yielded to Christ, then you know you don't belong to him. Are you willing to yield yourself to the Son of God who died on Calvary's cross for you? Are you willing to say, Lord, well, tonight I yield myself to you. You have the power of decision over me. 
We're told in verse 3, And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Here is his will. Be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Notice the approach of the man. He came worshipping. He came prostrating and bowing before Christ. Secondly, let's look at our chapter. Verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. To my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them the following, Verily, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel, but I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. The centurion comes to Christ in a different way. The leper comes worshipping, in other words, worshipping at the word as he approaches, but yet he couldn't touch Christ. Christ touched him. Maybe you feel like that. Where are you, Lord? Help me. And then the centurion comes beseeching him. The word beseeching here is the word parakaleo. And it gives the idea to call to one side or to call along to one's aid, to call along to one's help. In other words, the centurion, because of his status, a centurion soldier, he hadn't leprosy either. He was a man who was a, who was in health, as it were, and he comes up right up close to Jesus, like a Roman soldier could and would. And he comes alongside, right up to his ear, as it were, and he makes intercession for his servant that's lying sick at home. Maybe tonight there's someone here and someone's lying sick at home. You can stand in the gap and say, Lord, will you give me the word for them? Lord, will you give me the rima, the quickened word of God for them? Will you give me chapter and verse, Lord? Will you give me, Lord, what it takes to raise them up, Lord? Will you anoint me with your spirit, Lord, that when I go home, I will pray in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, for the healing of their body. He came and was an intercessor for his servant. Notice this. He comes beseeching alongside Jesus, asking him, The word here, parakaleo, for beseeching, is used of every way of calling. So you can call in different ways, but you come up close. Can you come here? Will you do this? Will you do that? It's the same word. But it gives the idea of that, which means one who comes along to call to produce a particular effect in what they're asking. To produce a particular effect in what they are asking. Jesus said sometimes we pray amiss. And our prayers go on, don't get answered to what we want. If you're coming tonight and say, Lord, give me the lottery numbers, forget it. Lord, I want to have my jet airplane by the time I get home, forget it. If you're saying, Lord, I want to belong to you, then you've got it. You've got it. Lord, I repent of my sin. I need forgiveness, you've got it. Here it means to produce a particular effect. So when we're going to worship in a while, worship him, come before him, and you forget all who's around you and worship him like you've never worshipped before, like a dog licking his master's hand. I'm a child of God. I know you're a child of God if you're saved. I'm seated in Christ in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I know you are. But I'll tell you something. It depends how desperate you are, how close you'll get.
This man comes right up to Jesus, beseeching him, looking for a particular effect to happen, his servant to be healed. Verse 7, Jesus saith unto him, I will come, here's his will again, and heal him. We want to look at his word now. His word, the word of Jesus, okay? The word. First he had the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only. See, brothers and sisters, it's the power of the word. It's the power of the word. It's the authority of God's word. Look, if you are in a gospel meeting, and I don't know why we're all saved here or not, I don't know if we've all been saved, but if you're saved, you remember the then hour when you heard the word of God and by faith you received Christ and you knew in your heart that was it, settled and done. You took your God at his word. And the, the, the centurion says, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only. See, it's the word of God. It's the bare word of God. It's the authority of the word of God that brings the healing, that brings salvation. Because of what Christ has accomplished on Calvary's tree. Notice this. But speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Here's what I've written. One, the centurion's unworthiness does not cancel him out for healing. Lord, I'm not worthy. I I wouldn't even come. I don't even deserve it. Your unworthiness will not cancel you out for God's healing. It's called grace. Two, the centurion's unworthiness was outweighed by the worthiness of Christ. It's not about you, it's about him. It's not about this man, it's not about what I can do, I can do nothing, it's about him. His worthiness and what he has done and what he has accomplished is what we stand in tonight. When we pray, when we worship, when we sing, and when we lay hands, and whatever way the Spirit takes form tonight, it is to do with him and what Christ has done and accomplished, it's not our worthiness. Dear, help us if it was up to us, we'd all, we'd all be in a terrible mess. We'd all be lost. Thirdly, the centurion's worthiness is no obstacle for God's will. And it's no obstacle of God's word. It's because you're unworthy. It doesn't mean to say God's word can't pierce your heart. Because you're unworthy doesn't mean to say God's will will not be done. God is sovereign supreme, curious, complete in order and control of all things. Fourthly, the centurion seeing and knowing his unworthiness. Now, maybe this is you tonight. The centurion seeing and knowing his unworthiness shows that his faith must be completely in Jesus alone. That's only how, the only way you and I can come to the Lord Jesus is to realize It's not of you. You can do nothing. You can do nothing for your salvation. It doesn't matter about your works and your denomination. It doesn't matter about Elam movement or whatever it may be. It matters nothing. You must realize, I am unworthy of all of your glory or any part of you, Christ. The Lord Jesus, will you come and will you have mercy on me? That's what this centurion was doing. He's a man in authority. It It took a lot for him to humble himself in the sight of the Lord. Took a lot. My prestige? What people think of me in society? I am a centurion, have soldiers under me. Here, go here and go there. Jesus says, Well, is that so? You're saying you're not worthy, then I can work with that. This centurion, seeing his unworthiness, shows he was completely trusting in Jesus. And showing his and realizing his unworthiness showed that he was yet still coming to Christ, showing that he had faith in him which was alive and well. You know, you go to a meeting, maybe you're here tonight, I wasn't going to come, and somebody asked me, and I wasn't in the last minute, sure, is it used, worth my while? Am I going to go? What if this doesn't happen, or what if that does happen? Is it worth my while? But I ended up, I'm here, and somebody invited me. I didn't want to let them down. You know what? Maybe that's happened to you, and you felt so unworthy. You were never going to come. 
but have something to tell you, friend. Have something to tell you, brothers and sisters, on this. It shows something. You're not here by an accident. You're here by divine appointment. You are here because Christ is here. The centurion met Christ on the way, not realizing he was going to meet him that day. And he says, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. It's the same word that was spoken into nothingness, and the words were framed. It's the same word upholed all things by the word of his power. It's the same word. And he speaks the word. You know what that tells me? If you're in the right place and you want to come and humble yourself before God tonight, if you want to come and worship, you might have a loved one somewhere else. Say, Lord, my daughter, my son, my, my servant, whoever it may be, my mom, my dad, my, my grandparent or whatever, my friend is lying home in a sick or they're in hospital bed. Speak the word only. His word's already there. Time's flying and I have to, I'm getting carried on with this. I have to wrap this up. Christ gives a warning, verse 11. I say unto you, the man shall come from the east and west, shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. This warning is this. Even if you're saying, well, I had godly grandparents or godly parents, your, your, your race and lineage will not count for you in the kingdom of God. You must be saved by grace through faith. That's what he's saying here. It doesn't matter. You, you can turn around and say, I'm as white as a driven snow in this thing. You can turn around and say, well, I come from an Israelite background. You can turn around and say, well, I come from an Indian background or whatever he's saying. It doesn't matter what background you're from. It doesn't matter why you come on a Protestant background or a Catholic background or a Hindu background or a Muslim background or a Jewish background. He says, do you know something? He says, even those who are proclaiming to be the children of God in Israel, they will come if they do not have faith in me and they will be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brothers and sisters, we know we have made our calling and election sure in Christ and I trust all in this house tonight have. Are you saved? That's the warning. Moving quickly. We have his warmth, and I'll just mention it without getting into it too much. In Mark's gospel, in Matthew's gospel, and in Luke's gospel, Matthew 8, Mark 1, Luke 4, tells us about Peter's mother. Let your eye run down to verse 14. And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered. Unto them, here is his warmth. That is the warmth of his heart. You need to understand he loves you. You need to understand he loves you. I'm going to say it again. First of all, understand he loves you. And do you know when someone loves you, they do anything for you? When someone loves you, they'll do anything for you. Anything good for you. Understand he loves you. The warmth of the touch of his hand... He touches the leper. He touches Simon Peter's mother. And we'll not hover around too much. Moving quickly. Here is the warrant I want to look at before we wrap this up. The warrant. Let your eye run down to verse 16. And when even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all. Healed all that were sick. He healed all that were sick. Do you know when Jesus says, I will come? Do you know whenever you ask for the pastor or the elders or someone or a friend to come, will you come and pray? Will you come with uh, somebody sick and we go to go with you? We will come and pray for him. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus says, I will come and heal. He didn't say, I'll come and pray. He says, I'll come and heal. When our faith is in Christ, we often understand that when he comes, he comes with a purpose in view. When he comes, he comes with a positive purpose and view. He says, I will come to heal. He healed all that we have spoken about, and now he heals all that were sick. Here's the warrant in verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, or Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. What were they speaking of? Isaiah 53, the 
chapter of Isaiah from the cross. Isaiah 53 and verse 5 of the Lord Jesus where said, he, it tells us, For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes ye are healed. 750 years before he's born in Bethlehem, ye are healed. Now he comes and he does all the healing. And Matthew tells us, Matthew 8 and verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, or Isaiah, the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. People say it's only your sin. That's not what the scripture says. It says our sicknesses too. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, Peter speaking of the Lord Jesus says, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Isaiah says ye are looking forward to the cross. Christ comes and heals and he dies and he atones for our sins in the cross. He arises again and he ascends to the Father and he's interceding at the right hand of God for us. Peter, after the cross, looks back to the cross and the work of the cross, which Christ has accomplished on the cross. And he says, by his stripes, ye were, it's done, it's paid for, ye were healed. In Jesus' name, brothers and sisters, let us seek after him that he would come and heal. Lastly, his way. Young man comes to him, asks to follow him. Look at verse 21. He gives an excuse. Jesus tells him to follow me. He says, And another of the disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me to go first and bury my father. And Jesus saith unto him, Follow me, let the dead bury their dead. Now listen. I say this with the I'm not saying it to try and be hard or cruel. I'm not saying it to try and be antagonistic. I'm saying it with all the love in my heart. There are Christians today who as far as the things of God are and the spirit of God, the authority of the word of God, and even the healing of Christ, they're dead. And if you have listened to them all your life, you've now seen life in Christ. Jesus says, now follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. There's life to be had here. There's healing to be had here. There's health to be had here. The warrant of God is given at the cross. The full atonement of the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. 